All right. So you're all set, Erica. I'm all set over here. All right. Ready to start, Ted? Yes. Okay. Here we go. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. Our first, excuse me, our first Ask a Guide uh, that is about the town. So today it's uh, Ask a Gettysburg Guide Town Edition. Bet some of you didn't know that there are town guides out there. There certainly are. They've been there, been around for a while, and you can uh, get yourself a guide, go around the town, and uh, I mean, obviously, it's in the name, so clearly that's what you would do with them, but I don't think a lot of people realize that the town was part of the battle, and there's a lot to see there. The civilians are people that you want to get to know. What they did during and after the battle is fascinating stuff. And uh, these people in the town guide force are the ones who can uh, take you around and show you. So our first town guest or town guide guest today is Ted Hurt. Welcome, Ted. Thank you very much, Matt. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. I didn't open you. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt, for having me here today. You're welcome. Uh, so... Let's tell us a little bit about you before we get into what the town guides are. Um, where where are you from originally? What got you into all this? Sure. Um, I'm originally a Connecticut Yankee uh, from Stanford, Fairfield County. And um, I practiced law in Washington, D.C. for about 36 years. Uh, I retired in 2016. Uh, I became a town guide in 2018. Uh, in addition to being a town guide, I'm also on the board of trustees of the Adams County Historical Society, which I'll mention at some point during the program sure. as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, so what got you interested in the Civil War? Uh, is this a lifelong thing or? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, very um, hereditary because uh, I recently found uh, in my family uh, archives a postcard uh, to my uncle in 1933 from my grandparents, uh, and the uh, the postcard is the observatory um, on the July 1st battle area, mm-hmm. and my grandmother is saying that my father is up in the in the observation tower, um, and I also have a photo of my grandparents uh, and uh, uh, parents, um, my dad. Uh, at the high water mark in 1938, and, wow. and I wonder to this day if they were there uh, during the ceremonies or they just happened to be there in 1938. I, I found recently uh, around Christmas time, I uh, I took my recorder home, and I, I want to start getting interviews with all the old folks in my uh, you know my parents' generation because they're the old folks now, and. Um, Uh, So I started with my father and we were looking through old photo albums and I found two pictures of him and his sister, my aunt, um, in front of Ricketts Battery over here on Cemetery Hill. And uh, I said, oh, that's I didn't know you were here as a kid. He goes, yeah, I don't don't really remember it. So he he didn't remember it, but uh, I thought that was cool. So I I took a picture of that and, uh, you know, it it kind of is like, I guess it's in my blood, even though he had no idea he was here (laughs) to to be obsessed with the place. Um, All right. So did you go to school for history or what did you go to school for when you? uh... Yeah, I um, I um, went uh, to uh, Brown University in Rhode Island for history and I have a B.A. and master's in American history. Uh, uh, They did. Ironically, they did not have a Civil War focus as such Mm -hmm. More early Americans. So uh, one of the professors I studied under uh, is is still very much uh, in the field. uh, Gordon S. Wood, uh, Revolutionary War historian, who still is in the papers uh, occasionally on commentary. And um, from there, I went to law school and then uh, back to Washington, D.C. And so uh, I live up here part time in the borough as well. So I'm not a. I'm not a hundred percent in DC at this point. And, um, but Veronica, he's the one whose bench was stolen, right? Yeah. So your bench was stolen here. Yeah. Town. We have, uh, we have, um, uh, been in the Gettysburg times twice, uh, <laughs> this past year. Uh, first because our, our bench, uh, on Baltimore street was taken one night. Uh, the good news is that, uh, the, uh, we have a replacement bench, uh, and uh, the painter 
uh, is uh, Marty Mummert, who a lot oh, yeah. of you may know. So yeah. uh, we're we're grateful to him and to another benefactor for for the bench. Never found the original. No, it's still missing, and uh, uh, there may be a reward out for it, but I haven't confirmed the amount of the reward. Very nice. Um, and your uh, the new bench is it bolted to the sidewalk now or something? Yes, we actually have it bolted to the sidewalk. Good. Good. Okay. <laughs> Not that Good. we suspect any. No, it was probably Everything, just some but, kids thinking it would be funny to steal a bench, right? I mean, well, it could have walked away, but no. No, yeah, I don't think so. Yes, okay. <laughs> no, it's probably some little punks. Um, all right, so uh, we're going to get into now, we're talking about the town, the history of the town of Gettysburg. Uh, before we do, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. YouTube is where you'll find our live Friday shows at 5 Eastern, and make sure you have your notifications turned on. Also, if you use the pop, blah, 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 if you use the Apple Podcast app, please leave a five-star review. Reviews, liking, sharing, and subscribing are the best ways to help us grow our audience. Okay, so take us back to the beginning, Ted. The right. beginning of what became the town of Gettysburg. Okay, well, this is, um, uh, for the sake of the viewers or listeners, I'll, I'll call it a really uh, quick walk through history. Uh, basically, I'm going to try to focus on uh, the revolution to, um, I'll say, secession or yeah. immediately before that. Okay. Uh, so, as a lot of people know, the frontier in the 1700s is basically um, the Susquehanna River, uh, but York County is formed. And then by 1740, uh, you have settlers pushing west uh, into what's now Adams County, and you have another group of settlers actually pushing north from Maryland. And that actually creates some some boundary disputes and some land disputes. But uh, the settlements that we focus on are basically in Adams County. Uh, one's called the Marsh Creek Settlement. Mm -hmm. uh, the other's called the Conewago Settlement. I'm not, never sure if I'm always pronouncing Conewago correctly. Conewago. Conewago. Yeah. That's that's probably better. Um, and uh, so basically, uh, the uh, the focal point becomes uh, our town, Gettysburg, uh, because Samuel Gettys uh, starts a tavern there in about 1762. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in that time period, uh, you had uh, what passed for roads were basically mud tracks that had been improved. And uh, we, of course, as we all know, are, are the crossroads mm -hmm. of, of intersecting roads. And it made sense uh, for Gettys to have a tavern at the junction of roads that are going sure. north and south and east and west. And so the town basically becomes founded uh, almost on his front doorstep. And uh, so he's a tavern keeper. And uh, uh, one of the side effects of the American Revolution is that basically he loses his money. Mm. Uh, whether it's investments or debts, uh, I, I won't try to say which is which in, in terms of what brought him down. Right. Uh, the good news is that his son James uh, buys his father's land at a sheriff's auction. And uh, so he converts about 116 acres uh, into a very regular grid plan. I'm not sure if that's one of the visuals. Uh, basically, he uh, uh, sets up 210 lots and they're all uniform, uh, and he offers them through a lottery. And so the town is the town uh, birth date, I'll say, is 1786, when the first plots of land are are set out for sale. And uh, if you look at a map uh, of the lots and compare them to today, uh, the square is about where it should be. There's a little bit of road diversion, uh, but it's not uncommon to have. Uh, older towns with a, with a square uh, in the center. Mm -hmm. uh, and ironically, uh, when, um, when the town uh, is established as the county seat uh, in 1800, uh, we eventually get a county courthouse, and it's actually put right in the middle of the square. And there's a photo of that, I think, in yeah. the visuals that, I can, that, that, that we can talk about. That's uh, something that's so hard to imagine is the courthouse being right in the middle of the square. But it was it was different then because the traffic wasn't automobile. It was horses and carriages, and it was yeah. a little easy. I guess you could put it there, and it wouldn't be so odd. But I think today, well, especially the way... People in this town have a habit of running into buildings. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I think yeah. If you put that. 
Yeah, one of the uh, one of the jokes that I tell on my tour, depending on the um, the audience, will I will uh, I will say to them, well, you know, uh, if you notice around the square, even today, uh, there are a lot of attorneys' offices, and back in the 1800s, there were attorneys uh, who had their offices on the square as well, including uh, Thaddeus Stevens at one point. And I always joke to people. Uh, you know, back then, if you were late to court, running late to court, you might get hit by a horse. Uh, today, you wouldn't want to do it because, uh, you know, it'd be a, a even more serious accident if, uh, if the court were still there. Yeah, but, yeah. but the Absolutely. courthouse moved, so. So they move it, um, but that's later on. We'll yes. get to that later. Yes. Um, so, okay, so in those very early days, though, when it's uh, just uh, James Gaddy's now, uh, he's got it. Uh, you said there was some road diversion. So where were the roads originally, and why did they, they divert them to where they run today? Is that what you're saying? Or? Well, uh, I didn't bring this visual, but I've seen uh, an overlay that shows that the map junction is a little to the north and a little to the east. Uh, uh, and I, my understanding would be that it make more sense to have it uh, align with the grid. Uh -huh. uh, I also know that Baltimore Street was actually um, realigned later in part because of traffic and the, and I'll call it the, the elevation of it. So it's not exactly the same as the, as what I'll call the frontier or uh, Revolutionary War era roads, but pretty close. Uh, am, do, am I understanding this correctly that uh, what's Wainwright Avenue now and then the alley it connects to that goes behind Mr. G's is the original Baltimore Pike? I've heard that, yes. I've okay. heard that uh, from do we not a good source. Do we not know where the original bedding or bed uh, of the road I'm was? sure that the, uh, what I'll call the professional historians like Tim Smith of the <laughs> Historical Society uh, know that quite well. I, okay. I maybe have heard that from him. So we, Tim hasn't told the licensed town guide force that information so that they could share it with everyone. Well, if, if he has, it hasn't uh, gotten it hasn't past, it past my <laughs> my research. So okay, um, it's on our list because that's one of the things that I've recently become uh, interested in are the. Uh, the the old roads oh yes on the park and then town and all that yeah. other stuff and I don't know why I find it so fascinating because because they don't do a very good job of trying to hide where they were I think that's why I find them fascinating yeah like how could I not have figured these out or noticed them because you know like the ones in the the old park roads you could usually tell because the grass is a different color and you yeah. can see the old uh, gutters and stuff you know where the gutters were and everything but the town's a little harder yeah but anyway uh, okay so. Uh, James, uh, he, he breaks it up into uh, little lots. Yes. Yeah. And uh, decides he's going to, uh, lottery, you said? It was the yes, lottery uh, that people, people would put in a, a ticket of some sort and they would get a lot. What, now, is there, besides his tavern, he took over his father's tavern, right? Right. Okay. Besides that, who else is here? Like, is has there been a settlement kind of growing up around the tavern since Sam started it, or is it just a tavern at a crossroads? Well, he he actually uh, his father kept operating the tavern um, uh, even though the bankruptcy had occurred. Uh, I understand. Uh, the, it's hard to tell because uh, we don't have a lot of original lots in in the in the um, in the uh, radius leading out of the um, out of the square oh. um, the oldest house off the square right now is the uh, Kadori Hoke house on York Street and that's 1786 which one is that that's now the Brafferton Inn oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so that's that's the oldest the Swope house Oh no, no, next Swope to it. The, further no, that's, down the yeah, street. yeah, yeah. Brafferton's yeah. next to uh, right. yeah. the for the historian. Okay, right, go ahead. Right. Go ahead. Now there was when you talk about the Swope House, uh, I learned from their owner, um, and I've seen it in in um, property record that there was a log cabin uh, um, just west of the uh, brick part of the Swope Manor, and the the log cabin would have been torn down. Uh, to create the the addition, I guess, to the smoke okay. manor. So, so there would have been a log cabin there. And in fact, uh, there's a very uh, famous uh, photo of a log cabin on Steinware Avenue about where the Avenue restaurant is. Uh, so there, there are going to be log cabins scattered about. Uh, I've not seen a grid that shows 
um, exactly which building went up when and mm -hmm. on my research list is to try to find somewhere where they've had all the buildings placed in chronological order, but I haven't, haven't seen that yet. I take it then it's because records weren't well kept back then, or do, are there no records in the courthouse or anything? Well, I don't know the answer to that. I think that the problem may be that uh, what we're looking for is uh, trying to find something that requires assembling of a lot of pieces of information. Got it. Uh, the, the Historical Society does have... Um, uh, again, I, I'll give Tim Smith credit for this. Uh, they do have a property history of each of the 210 lots hmm. uh, going back to Gettys. Okay. So uh, if somebody sat down uh, and went lot by lot, uh, they probably could uh, do this chronology uh, as long as the chronology shows when the first structure was put on it. Right. Okay. So it could, it could be done. I I don't know if anyone has done it. That's so fine. so early earlier in this part of the discussion, yeah. you said uh, that there are no original lots. Uh, but did you mean buildings? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because yes. yeah. the so the lots are all the same as James Getty's laid out yes. way back when. Yeah. Those didn't shift in any way. They wouldn't shift. I I can't say though. I'm sure some of them would be consolidated. Well, like I'm yeah. thinking, yeah, like the uh, the Pierces and the Shrivers, they had space in between their house because it was the garden. Okay, you know, so like, yeah. so some I know that some lots were that now homes were once the garden for the house next to it. Yeah, because it was like every other one was wide open yeah. because it's a garden. Yeah, so so then those would have been newer lots that yeah. were developed. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. So <clears throat> he sets up this town. Uh, the lottery is played. People win the lottery. They get their uh, lots. What does the town become at first? Well, the town uh, is basically the county seat. Okay. Uh, so you have the courthouse, 1804, 1806 range. Right. So we're early 1800s right. now. Uh, eventually there will be a jail. Uh, you'll also uh, have... Eventually there would be a jail. Yeah. I'm not sure when that came in. Why would you wait on a jail? Well, I don't know. <laughs> you I would think that would be one of the yeah. first... The jail and a hospital are the well, two first uh, things I would need. Yeah. I don't know the, I don't know the, uh, the uh, first jail uh, creation. Uh, we don't have a hospital. I... Uh, that might be a mystery to some people, but there's no hospital in Gettysburg at the time of the battle. Um, and maybe that was reserved for larger cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore. Yeah, I was going to say, is that a thing? The small towns having hospitals back then? I'd I wouldn't a, think probably so. Probably a sawbones yeah. and that would be it, right? Well, we have uh, we do have several prominent doctors in town, I'll yeah. uh, say that. Uh, so is it is it immediately, yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to throw no, you off please. there, but immediately the, when the town is first developed, after those lots start being developed, um, is it, uh, what are the people like? Are these, I mean, they're, they're winning them in a lottery, so we can't just assume that they're all moneyed people, can we? Well, I don't know the demographics of the, um, uh, meaning the economic demographics of the original uh, owners. Um, if we sort of expanded outside the, the lots to the rest of the borough and into the outlying townships, uh, you're gonna have much more of an agricultural uh, flavor uh, mm. with, um, I'll use this sort of uh, roughly, uh, you're probably gonna have more farmers who are Scots, Irish, and German. Uh, the storekeepers may well be more predominantly Scots Irish at first, okay. in terms of the, the last names I've seen, uh, in terms of storekeepers and and uh, similar records. So uh, you're going to have a real mix of uh, residential and business. And uh, the other thing you see is that uh, you're going to have what I'll call mixed use. A lot of people will have their uh, businesses uh, and their houses on the same part of the property. Hmm. You might have your house in the front and your uh, workshop in the back. Right, so right. That's, uh, so you've got a, you've, you don't have a, what we think of today as a separation of industrial, commercial from residential. It's very much uh, 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 
integrated. Mm -hmm. And since uh, you have long, narrow lots, that makes sense. You can have a business operating in the back uh, of your lot. Yeah. Contiguous to an alley. So didn't, was, uh, was it, who is it, who is it, uh, Tilly Pierce, was her dad a butcher? Didn't he have a, but where did he have a butcher shop? Um, was it I in don't, the back of the house? It's quite possible yeah. uh, because people had um, people had their their shops as close as possible to their place of of, of sale. Right. Uh, I mean, the tannery, uh, the two tanneries uh, on Baltimore Street mm-hmm. are very close to the square. So you have you have what I'll call a more heavy industry. Uh, you know, just south of the uh, original 210 lot area, which would be a a logical place, and, and then north of town, yeah, you have brickyards. So we become industrial uh, at the fringes of the town. Now, about what period did the tannery go in, or or did all of these industries kind of go? Like, so 1800s, early 1800s. Yeah. By now, the town's established. Right, it's become the county seat of the new Adams County. Right, um, and uh, no railroad yet. That's right. But you got all these roads coming in. So I've got to imagine that for the farmers in the surrounding area that their goods come into town and then make their way out to wherever they need to go. Or if they're being sold in town and they're going into stores. and th- Is that kind of well, how it all worked? Um, I would say this on the, um, on the store side that um, the merchants in town are getting – probably a lot of their materials from Baltimore and Philadelphia because you see a lot of advertisements for clothing uh, that will say this is just in from Philadelphia. Uh. Uh, So the merchants are getting a lot of um, their goods from larger areas. Now that's not to say they're not doing individual tailoring and clothes making. Uh, The farmers are probably uh, bringing um, their goods, uh, but since there's no railroad, they probably are maybe relying on sending some down into Maryland, mm, okay. uh, probably into the uh, port of Baltimore, maybe. Uh, maybe I, I'd say maybe also um, south and west into uh, Maryland. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, so you've got because you've got a network that goes sure. in that direction too. That's right. That's right. So. And then it's so it's probably being supplied from Baltimore and Philly. Uh, with things that they can't produce in Adams County, and then from Adams County, they're sending it to other parts of Maryland and Pennsylvania that m- might not be producing these things or something like that. Well, a, a good example, um, and I've, 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 I've provided some visuals on this too, is that um, you have a really large industry, I think, by anyone's standards of coach and carriage making, mm-hmm. and um, at any one time, in this sort of 1830s, 1840s period, you're going to have anywhere from 12 to 15 independent uh, coach and carriage makers. And the history tells us that their market for coaches and carriages was actually the Shenandoah Valley. Hmm. So um, there's an account I've seen that uh, uh, one of the manufacturers would have a like a convoy of carriages and presumably they're heading... I'll say down the Fairfield Road, they're heading southwest into Virginia. Uh, you wouldn't be trying to sell your coaches probably in Baltimore. That's my guess because Baltimore presumably has mm. uh, a more mature manufacturing so Gettys- system. Gettysburg you know. then is kind of like a mini city out in the wilderness. So you know what I mean? Like it, it seems like it's just kind of this uh, outpost. Uh, at first, you know, as as the country grows, it's this outpost, and then it grows into a like a you know a, compared to what else is out there in Adams County, at least yeah. you know it's a big city. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll I, I don't want to push back too much on this, but I push guess I will say, oh, I guess I will say that um, certainly we we the borough are the hub uh, commercially of the county. Uh, But I will confess, again, not being a Pennsylvanian, that I know almost next to nothing about Carlisle to the north of us and uh, Chambersburg to the west of us. Now, of course, Chambersburg is across the mountain, uh, so it's got a little bit of of separation. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't so I really don't know when we're thinking about those two uh, 
areas how commercial they will be. Right. Uh, I did try to find out that they have a hospital uh, before the war, and it doesn't seem like they had a hospital either. So right. we weren't um, we weren't um, uh, far behind in that in that uh, specific uh, area. So sure. Well, we're in a big city, I guess. So like we were saying, I guess the big cities are the ones that have the hospitals. So if you were really bad in Gettysburg, then I guess you'd have to be taken to a hospital. But then by that point, that traveling back then? Who knows? Yeah. But anyway. Uh, yeah. All right. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, no. Unless you were. Had to. <laughs> so uh, the carriage industry becomes big. Right. Definitely. And is that is that the most successful industry from town? And then all the other ones are kind of somehow related to that? Well, um, taking that question, um, sort of going backwards a little bit, the uh, to, a coach and carriage are not made, uh, uh, you know, all at once. It's like, right. uh, I won't use the word assembly line because I've never seen it done, but you have what I'll call support industries. Mm. Uh, you're going to have wheel rights. You're going to have uh, saddle makers, and, yeah. harness makers. Uh, you're going to have someone for uh, all of the uh, all of the trappings, if I can use that word. Uh, you're going to have to have wheel rights. You're going to have to have uh, cabinetry men. Uh, you're going to have to have people who are making the upholstery and the trimmings. And there's a uh, an ad I saw in the paper. Uh, from from the Faunastock brothers, who are the largest merchants, and they actually have an advertisement that, among other things, they're selling coach trimmings. Okay. So I think it's a fairly well integrated system uh, of of people who are involved in this in this industry. And uh, one other thing I'll mention is that uh, uh, there's also a foundry, an iron foundry, hmm. um, and. Uh, uh, it advertises that it's making all sorts of agricultural um, uh, implements, uh, stoves, uh, you know, various things that are kitchen oriented. So, uh, so we have something that's also uh, closer to what we'll call industrial. Mm. Uh, and you won't be relying. It will probably mean you aren't relying as much on Baltimore, let's say, or Harrisburg for your iron. Uh, because you've got it there. Uh, the other thing, I would just say this isn't quite industrial, but it's similar is that uh, not too long before the Civil War, there actually was a gas works. So people could actually have gas piped into their homes uh, in Gettysburg. Yeah, uh, I heard that. Which is unusual, I think, for, yeah. for this I, I wonder how many did. Uh, that would be a great thing to know. Um the the gas works is uh, I'm going to say 1858 1859 it's okay. relatively recent uh, and it would be uh, it would be a good uh, architectural question to figure out who has original gas fixtures yeah. from that time period yeah. I've I've seen one recent advertisement uh, in a newspaper where the seller is noting that the that natural gas is in the house. So maybe it was a selling point. And when was that from? Uh, I'm going to say this is like 1860 ad. I'm not sure. Okay. In that time period. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. And where and where was the gas works located? The gas works is located, I believe, north of the railroad tracks. Uh, and I'm not sure whether it's. Uh, I've seen different descriptions. I'm going to say, but I'm just guessing that it's over near that area that that may be developed uh, west of Stratton. Uh, okay, but it might have been on the other side too. I haven't seen a map in a long time of the gas works, but okay. So then, um, the uh, other thing that Gettysburg is uh, known for is uh, the institutions of education, right? Right. And uh, there's uh, a few of them. What the college is built in 1832. Two. Two. Yeah. Two. I was going to say six. Yeah, you're close. The yeah. seminary is 36, right? Uh, I think it's 26. 26. 20. That's why okay. we, we won't be kept to precise dates today. Yeah, uh, yeah, because we're not talking about either one of them, so I didn't bone up on it. Um, okay, I could so, be wrong by two years as well. I'm not. Well, Mike was not in yes, right? 26, 18, uh, 26. Okay. Okay. I'll stand I knew there was a time. six in there. I just <laughs> didn't remember what decade. Yeah. Um, so the, you've got those two. Right. Uh, but there's other ones. There's smaller ones, too. There's a lot of boys' schools and girls' schools. and. Yeah, I mean, basically... Um, 
you know, uh, if we go all the way back in time, supposedly Reverend Dobbin uh, starts mm. a, a classical school uh, during the revolutionary period. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you don't have, uh, and this is true of many states, you don't have a, a public school system until well into the 1800s. So Pennsylvania actually has a free publication, free education law, public education, in about 1834, 1835. Uh, by the time of the Civil War, we definitely have a public school, and in fact, it's the building on High Street where the uh, housing authority is. Uh, but your, your uh, schooling is still somewhat catch-as-catch-can in that time period. Uh, before the public school facility, you may be using uh, private rental space. Uh, but the certainly that I think the town is somewhat distinguished because it does have these private academies, uh, and some are um, for girls. I'm not sure about. There must be one for for boys only, but I know we have at least one girls academy. Uh, the Carrie Sheeds Academy. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe the Eister Academy Eister. would be women. Uh, so those are those are substitutes. Uh, my guess is that that's going to be uh, a more affluent demographic. Uh, I've seen one roster for the Eister Academy, and it's interesting because there are a number of local families who did have their girls enrolled in the Eister Academy, but you will see... Uh, some from from out of state as well, so it's it's sort of interesting. I've I've only seen one of these rosters, so I don't want to generalize. Did uh, now you mentioned before that the uh, the the one school was in the housing authority building, public school, right? Right. Yes. What? what, what oh, is that the uh, school across from the municipal building? Yes. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, and what year was that put in? Uh, I'm going to guess 1850 something. Okay, uh, it's there certainly at the time of the battle. I'm going to guess in the mid 1850s without looking it up. Okay, yeah, it seems like the 1850s was when a lot of big or new things were being built. Yeah. Uh, when did the telegraph get here? Uh, I'm thinking about. I used to know that as well. Uh, I'm 58? thinking again. It's about in that 58, 59 yeah. range. Uh, and the tra the the railroad tracks were or the train was coming in 1858 or came in 1858. Yeah. The uh, the um, there's a great advertisement uh, um, for the opening of the railroad, uh, and I'm going to guess it's around December 18th, 1858. Wait a minute. Let me see. 1858. Let me double check. All I right. do have that in front of me. Go ahead. Yeah, it's December 1858. If that's okay. like something you can look at. Oh yeah. Uh, now the railroad had opened uh, then, and the, then the railroad station opened itself in '59, so that the, the um, Got it. people could take the train to Gettysburg. And uh, I understand that a hotel, which uh, stood on the site of the Lincoln Diner called the Washington Hotel mm. was basically the de facto uh, train station waiting room. So, Makes sense. So, But it was a big deal, as this uh, newspaper ad indicates, to have the railroad well, uh, sure. come to your town December 1858. It's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, that opens everything up. Yes, yes. It opens the world up to you and you yep. to the world and all that other jazz. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. that's a good thing to have. And then uh, they, they build the, the current courthouse in that year, too. 1858, yes. Yep. And uh, so the the one that was in the middle of the square was there all the way up until they built the new one? I believe it was torn down, but I'm not sure when uh, when it was formally decommissioned. Okay. So uh, I don't I mean, know the answer to that offhand. Probably. I know I know the square, or I, I'm, I'm led to believe that the square was just a wide open square. There were no lanes. There was no sidewalk. Um, it was just this wide open dirt, or at least the way I've seen it depicted in yeah. paintings. So uh, I guess I guess it, there's a little more room to put a building in the middle of the square. And I've seen the drawing of it, but it's just so hard to imagine. Well, it probably, I've not seen an interior sketch of it, but um, a description I saw indicated that there was basically a courtroom um, and maybe some offices, but I read somewhere else that some of the offices were off site on presumably York Street. 
Okay. So it wasn't. Uh, so it's basically it as big as the shed a, that we're in right now. Well, I hope. It, I don't know. <laughs> I hope it's a little better. I have to be larger for for a good sized trial. Yeah, yeah, to be. yeah. Because if you're going to have an OJ trial back then, you need a lot of uh, space for the spectators. You know. Well, it was. Uh, um, whatever we say about our legal culture today, I think trials were a very popular event back in sure. the 1800s. So I think they people paid happen. attention. So. Sure. Yeah. Where, where, you pro- I'm, uh, I'm not going to expect that you know this, but just out of curiosity, we're talking about that. Where would they do hangings? Um, I have heard of two different places. Okay. Um, I've heard of one gallows down... Um, and I, I could be wrong geographically, but I'll say down by the junction, Tawny Town Road and Emmitsburg Road. Oh, okay. Oh, by Tommy's. In that area, yeah. Wow. Uh, and then I've heard of some newspaper reports of hangings in the confines of the jail complex. Okay. And where was the jail at that time? The jail is going to be... Uh, where the borough offices are today on high street. Yes. Right and so, uh, and in fact, again, I'll, I'll credit Tim Smith with this, but others have probably said it is that we have a wall alley, uh, in that vicinity and that marked the, the penitentiary or jail wall. Wall. So, you know, it's, so it's funny. That's, uh, what I'll, that's what I'll understand to be the case. It, years ago, I went, um, on a tour of lower Manhattan and it was a revolutionary war based walking tour oh yes very cool and uh that's how wall street got its name and there's there were a couple of other streets that were uh, named in the same vein and uh then i realized uh oh yeah i guess that's why every town has a middle street and a high street in their old section because like that was the middle street that was the high street and it was the west street now we come up with these goofy names you know naming them after people and things but uh, I mean, I'm sure they did that too back then, but it just seems sillier now. Yeah. Well, just let's call it what it is. You know, the street that goes to grandma's house <laughs> or whatever. Um, so the the war as, oh, no, no. One more thing before we get to that. Sure. Uh, churches. Yeah, I guess I would, um, I would say, uh, and I don't think we're generalizing too much, is the, um, the settlers uh, in Adams County, uh, were very conscious of their religious heritage, sure. and uh, the uh, there's a, a great uh, woodcut from 1843, uh, and again, it's a visual I probably supplied um, from uh, uh, from uh, William Prasenito's uh, Gettysburg Bicentennial album, which captures a lot of images from that period, and you can see the church spires. And uh, you can, if you're if you're good, you can pick out which ones were there right. at the time. Uh, but you know, uh, if you looked at um, just a roster of the Civil War hospitals in 1863 during the battle, um, you have uh, St. Francis Xavier. You have the uh, a Presbyterian church across the way. You have the German Reformed Church at Stratton mm-hmm. uh, Street. Uh, you had at one point an Episcopal church uh, to the north of town. Um, you have St. James Lutheran on Saint York James, Street. Yeah, yeah. You have Christ Lutheran uh, on, on Chambersburg Street. Uh, and you have at least, and this is where my knowledge again is murky, you have probably an African-American church uh, in in uh, the Washington well, Street the, area. The one on the corner there, um that that goes way back, doesn't it? Well, the AME Church on Washington and Breckenridge, I think, dates from 1913. But okay. but there would have been predecessor churches in that vicinity, uh, close by mm. at various times. So uh, I would say, based on my newspaper reading, in part that uh, uh, the Sabbath and church going was very important at the time, and it traces back to. Uh, uh, ties from England if, if, or Scotland if you're Presbyterian or uh, Methodist. There's a Methodist church again. Uh, I forgot about that where the GAR Hall is. Uh, right, right, right. Uh, right. That was a middle street. Methodist. Uh, mm-hmm. And the uh, Catholic faith comes very early. 
and uh, of course the uh, Pennsylvania Germans would be Lutherans right. to a large extent. And everybody seemed to get along? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I've that's one of those issues I'd love to get into more. I mean, I know that yes. within certain churches there were breakups. And, and I, I can't remember yes. which one it was. Do you remember, Mike? Luther, Luther who? Marsh, the, the Presbyterian Marsh Creek. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, right, yeah, the yeah. Marsh Creek one, and then the other one. Well, there, then. there's even. Um, um, I'll say there's some division within the Lutheran groups because uh, Reverend Schmucker, who's the founder of the seminary, was a uh, proponent of. I call it Americanization, but that's probably not the right word because he wanted his seminary students to uh, preach, teach, uh, converse in English. Uh, uh, the Germans having come from uh, mm. the German Lutherans having come from those uh, states, uh, uh, their native language was German, whether it was what we call Pennsylvania German or more of a pure German, they wanted uh, to continue to read the New Testament in German. So there's a diff there's a sort of a difference there in terms of uh, 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 it's not theological, I think, so much as just cultural. The, right. Uh, but you have so you have that. I think coming back to your uh, your bigger point, I I've heard different things about. <clears throat> um, uh, did the Scots Irish get on well with the Pennsylvania Germans and vice versa? Right. I just couldn't answer that question without. Uh, I haven't seen. I haven't seen that sort of um, tension in what I've read. But that's just me. I guess it all depends on where you're coming. Like, if you came up here, and I don't. I'm not talking about any particular era, except that pre-war. But if you yes. came up here from, say, Baltimore, or out from Philly yeah. or whatever. To me, it would be like I'm coming out here for more freedom because, you know, when you live in a city, there's too many rules, too many laws, too many ordinances, you know. So if you're if you're living out here, it, I don't know, it just might be like, you know what, thank God I'm out here. I don't care what the hell you do or where you come from or whatever. Let's make this good. I wonder if that's the attitude people had um, or if they said... You know, Catholics know. suck. And well, oh, yeah, well, Lutherans are horrible. And, you know, well, I, I, I will, um, I'll introduce a, a different theme, which is one we shouldn't necessarily omit, which is that, uh, although I haven't studied the politics of Adams County right. in this time period, um, certainly there was support uh, for the. Um, so-called American Party, whose nickname was the Know Nothing Party, right? And there was a strain of uh, anti-Catholic uh, sentiment in that party, uh, which uh, they linked back, actually, uh, obviously, well, maybe not obviously to some people, uh, to the fact that uh, there was a perception that the uh, Catholic churches reported uh, to the Pope, mm -hmm. and the Pope was uh, a secular as well as a religious. Uh, um, political figure. Mm -hmm. So there is a little, there is certainly not uh, an absence of that type of prejudice, but uh, I think in Pennsylvania and other northern states, it was, you know, certainly it was not um, as acute as maybe one would right. think it could be. Right. So again, coming back to your theme, I think that probably there were pretty good relations Across um, across these ethnic uh, barriers, it would be uh, it'd be really interesting if someone uh, tried to do a study of uh, intermarriage among the groups. Mm, that but, would be interesting. But I've not yeah. I've not seen one. And again, that's one of those things that probably is uh, complicated to undertake. I feel like I have heard of some people with a mick name. Uh, you know, marrying someone with a uh, German name That's before. Fine. So yeah. I would imagine that, that there would be some uh, intermarrying. Yeah, you know, I would each think generation so. yeah. gets more liberal than the last, you know? So maybe they'd be like, oh, I don't care that he's Lutheran mom. I love him, you know? And yes, he's yes. like, I don't care that she's a dirty Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that as a Catholic. Yeah. So well, I, I in my, in my own family, uh, I do know of, uh, from, again, secondhand, but pretty good sources that there was uh, 
a Lutheran Catholic uh, intermarriage in, in my family back in the, I'll say the mid 1800s that might have been controversial at the time. So. Are the Lutherans, uh, do they do communion? Are they similar to Catholics in that? I know there's one Protestant uh, denomination that does communion and is like, I went to one service once and it was like, this is no different than a Catholic mass. What, why do these people have their own church? It was either Presbyterian or Lutherans. I can't remember. Eric, do you know? Uh, I think you're thinking of Presbyterians. Presbyterians, yeah, okay. that makes sense. Anyway, right. that was just an aside. Okay, yes. so now, uh, so we have, uh, uh, now you mentioned one of the, uh, talking about the churches, you mentioned uh, the black church. Um, what about black people from the beginning all the way through? Yeah, this is, um, uh, I mean, this is a very um, interesting and, and uh I won't say dynamic, but I think uh, there's more and more work being done at a local level on the African-American uh, population in the mm -hmm. county. And, uh, you know, we, we could start almost at the very beginning because uh, there's evidence that uh, uh, there was uh, the term used nowadays, of course, is enslaved person. Uh, slave, whichever term you want to use, that um, in some of the prominent early families, uh, you would have, uh, based on documents like a will, that there would be slaves in that family. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Gettys family probably had one slave, maybe two slaves. Uh, so Dobbin. Dobbin uh, had probably slaves building uh, uh, his, his uh, stone structure. So you do have... Um, you do have at the beginning um, uh, slaves. Uh, one thing we always point out on our Black History Tour uh, is that um, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, as far as I can tell, is the first of the original 13 states to actually set in motion uh, a gradual abolition or emancipation mm -hmm. statute. It's mm -hmm. a 1780 law. And uh, as an attorney, I can tell you that I read it and I read it and I read it, and it's uh, still not totally clear to me. Uh, but I think if I were if I were involved in that uh, in that issue at the time, I would know exactly what it meant. Right, right. And um, probably it was a uh, uh, an outgrowth of of the American Revolution, uh, the notion that the patriots. Of Philadelphia realized that our rhetoric was we were um, breaking away from Great Britain because they treated us as if we were slaves, uh, but uh, we, we, we had they yeah. were slaves uh, in in our own colonies. Yeah. So the 1780 law is um, is a gradual emancipation, and uh, I'll say demographically. Uh, if you looked at the census 1790 compared to 1840, the number of slaves uh, registered uh, falls down to basically almost zero. Uh, so you have the the law works, if I can understand it correctly, that uh, if you were born into slavery 1780, you were going to remain a slave. Mm. Uh, but your offspring would not be slaves uh, in, in, that, um, in that sense. They would, however, be bound to service. Uh, and uh, it's, again, this is very complicated. Uh, I've, I've supplied some visuals that you can put on the program right. uh, that show uh, 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 an advertisement in a newspaper where basically the, uh, uh, the merchant, I'll say, says, I have, uh, his term, a Negro boy bound for service for a certain number of years. Uh, you will see posters placed in newspapers, I'll call them posters, uh, that are reward posters saying that uh, a person of this description uh, has run away and he or she has X years of service. Mm. Uh, now, one of the ironies which I point out sometimes on our tour is to, is to say that our our labor system, uh, more generally in the 1800s, was actually uh, included an apprentice uh, system right. uh, by which um, uh, 
I'll use the word white or Caucasian uh, young people could be bound to service uh, for a term of years sure. uh, to a blacksmith, a carpenter. And uh, I've seen uh, ads in the Gettysburg newspapers uh, by, by the blacksmith or the carpenter saying, my apprentice has run away and he has a certain number of years to serve. And uh, reading the um, reading that advertisement, there's no indication uh, to me that that the person is African American. He's not describing right, it. right. So uh, I'm not trying to create a value judgment or or anything like that. It's it's. Uh, uh, but I think, and I'm speculating because we weren't there in 1780. I'm thinking that the um, uh, the notion was that we'll replace this one system with something that's more analogous to a employment system, right. but it is, uh, as I've said on tours, 28 years, uh, that's a long it's term a of lifetime service. for some people. So, so was, it, was the idea that, okay, so if you're born before a certain date into slavery, you stay into slavery, but your offspring is free but bound to service for a number of years, right? I think that's right. That's okay. how I interpret it. Yes. Now, so did you come across anything um, that that explained, okay, after the service, then what? Is, so I guess, is it so that they can learn a trade when they're free? Is that the idea? Or well, why not just raise them well, like people? <laughs> well, I guess I would say, uh, and again, I'm just, I'm, I'm putting two thoughts together and right. making a third one, which is that if you... If you have a system that's that is apprenticeship oriented, uh, this law seems to um, go in that direction. Uh, the 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 understanding I always had from reading about the apprentice system was that the uh, young man, let's say, uh, in a in a carpentry or blacksmith context, would at the end of his service have a trade and be marketable. Uh, maybe he would go into partnership, but maybe he would go off on his own. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't know with the African Americans whether that was the expectation. Uh, the other thing that I think would be great um, uh, to locate uh, would be to be able to trace uh, these families and find out uh, what happened next. Uh, yeah, right. So now maybe there are oral histories uh, and other family records, uh, you know, by the descendants of these families. And I just haven't seen the uh, I haven't seen the actual examples. But you would think that it would make sense uh, that you would see this transition. Uh, on the other hand, if, if someone uh, is here during the term of service but they uh, finish their term and they go to Pittsburgh, uh, we'll not hear from them, right. you know, or about sure. them further. So it's, you know, to me, that's another, it's another historical mystery that probably can be explained or maybe has been explained and I haven't seen the fruits of that, you know, that inquiry, but those would be great things to find. Yeah. Um, you know, well, the historical societies, you know, in town, the Historical Society and the new African American Museum Group, they're trying to work on a lot of different things. I don't know if this is on their um, would be interesting uh, project list right now. It, it, so I've read somewhere once, and, and I keep forgetting to ask people who would know, and, and now I have someone here. So um, let me ask you this. I read somewhere that uh, traditionally, or however you want to put it, uh, since basically the either founding or let's say revolutionary period that the Washington street corridor there has been traditionally the, the black section of town. It was freed blacks that lived there back uh, in those days uh, in the early days, according to what I read. And I can't remember where I read this, but it was in a book that, you know, is considered legitimate. So um, have you heard anything about that or well, what do you know about that? Um, Based on what I've read, I think that demographically, that's probably uh, uh, probably a very fair statement based yeah. on on um, you know family uh, listings that I've seen. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I would say that's probably a demographic uh, makes sense. You know, solid yeah. point. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
it, it's interesting to see how different city, sized towns and cities, yeah. you know, kind of just all end up doing the same thing, you know. Um, all right, so getting up to 1860, um, can you talk a little bit about what the politics was like in 1860 in Gettysburg, what the political factions were? Yeah, um, I mean, basically, uh, Lincoln, and I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but Lincoln actually carries Adams County okay. uh, in 1860. Right Now, in fairness, there are several uh, competing presidential candidates. You have Douglas, and you have Breckinridge, and you have the uh, 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 the Union Party, I'll call it. Um, uh, I think it's Bell and Everett. Not mm-hmm. sure who the presidential candidate is, so come to me. Uh, uh, but the politically, uh, the borough, the county are, are very divided. And I'll, I'll just illustrate that by jumping forward, because in 1864, McClellan carries Adams County mm. and not Lincoln. Yeah. Um, I looked once at the voting patterns of Adams County for decades, uh, or at least during the, the eight-year cycle, four-year cycles, and um, it's often very uh, closely split between what we'll call Democrat versus Republican. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's... Uh, I think it's illustrated by the fact that uh, going back, I'll, I'll say, with a little bit of hesitation to the Jacksonian period, uh, the both major parties as we look at them today, Democratic and Republican, had very strong, uh, eloquent uh, leaders, civic leaders, and uh, newspapers that were pretty overtly uh, partisan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so um, in the 1830s, um, the Gettysburg compiler uh, was operated by, I think his name, Jacob Lefevre. Mm-hmm. And then that editorship is passed on to Henry Staley. And um, uh, I find Staley a very fascinating person to try to study. Uh, Why is that? Well, because he, uh, if I read his editorials, and, and uh, he, uh, uh, he's not a shy person. He uh, <laughs> he was very anti-Lincoln, uh-huh. and um, I, I I'm paraphrasing an account I saw once that he said that Lincoln had brought us, meaning Pennsylvania, uh, two things: uh, the draft and high taxes. And I, I could be exaggerating a little bit, but. Staley was not um, was not in favor of abolitionism. Right. He was not in favor of of um, the steps forward in reconstruction of of, of uh, as best I can tell the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, he claimed to be a unionist. He supported the union over the Confederacy, but he his editorials are always very uh, biting um, against um, Lincoln and the Republicans. Mm. Uh, And uh, leading up to the 1860, I've read some of his editorials as well, and um, he's uh, he's very much uh, against uh, the abolitionist fervor. Uh, I'm not saying he blames the Confederates for it or the secession for it, but he's a very... Uh, I, I would find him very fascinating to figure out because he's he's has this uh, he has this sort of streak uh, that that emerges uh, when some issue like that comes to the fore. So, and he, and he that was the compiler, yes, the, uh, Staley. Um, but there were two other papers, right? Yeah, and one of the most prominent one is I, I think, and it, I think it has different names. Robert G. Harper is uh, Sentinel. Uh-huh. And that's more of a Republican paper, and um, he, I haven't read his, I haven't read his uh, work as much, uh, but he seems to be, I'll I'll take the risk here and say, sort of a mainstream Republican. Okay, uh, I don't I haven't read enough of his. Uh, one frustration, as my excuse, is that. Uh, Reading newspapers online is a daunting experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you know the other problem, um, and I'm not sure. Um, 
my guess is that some of the online services just don't have complete editions or can't find can't complete find editions. Them, yeah. So there are always gaps in, in newspaper coverage, at least when I'm trying to find them. So yeah. that's, now, that's an issue for me. So did, yeah. Didn't... No, wait. So there was a second Republican paper, too, right? Uh, I'm going to go. There was a Star and Banner. Star and Banner. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, okay. And that now, so you got two Republican, one Democrat papers leading up to the uh, Lincoln's election. After Lincoln's election, and, you know, between Lincoln being elected and McClellan uh, running against him in 64, do we see maybe a new. Democrat paper coming up or at one of the Republican papers going out of business because the, the mood changes or, or well, is that I, all still the same? I do. I have to confess, I don't know the the evolution of the newspapers. Uh, this The compiler remains in place for a long time period. OK. Uh, so I don't think I, I don't know that I would say that the shift in election results is attributable to that type of influence. I'd say it was. Probably more uh, just the notion that uh, you have a divided county, right? And okay. probably a lot of people uh, are still oriented towards peace. Uh, you know, well, I would yes. imagine in the '64 election, after what happened in '63 here, you would not be too fond of the administration that, you know employs the army that let Lee slip away that ended up with your town being destroyed and your farm being destroyed. Like, I would imagine there might be some bitterness there. Well, and you know um, how we always blame the wrong people in this country. So <laughs> well, I don't know. I, you know, um, it would be interesting to try to line up the supporters of Lincoln in 64 at a local level and see where they were in 1862 or three. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my guess is that um, my guess is only that the people who stood with Lincoln in '63 stuck with him in '64. I think the more challenging question would be um, if I'm um, a farmer or a merchant or a farmhand or a mechanic in '64. Uh, am I influenced by? Um, you know, sort of the peace Democrat idea that McClellan is operating. Right. Um, people say that the soldier vote went to Lincoln, even though McClellan had been a very revered right. commander for him. them. Yeah. So how the soldier vote, um, it would be interesting to try to find the soldier vote for Adams County in 1864. That would be a demographic, but if it's like what we know, it would probably be a Lincoln demographic. Right. So it's more the civilians, uh, the civilian population that I would wonder about. Yeah, isn't that funny? The yeah. guy's actually getting blown to bits to vote for the guy who's going to keep getting them blown to bits. But the people back home, well, I mean, theoretically, we don't know yet because, but you know what I'm saying? Well, I guess I would say that, um, I would say that uh, Lincoln's prevailing in 1864 probably benefited from, you know, the success of the commanders right. um, in, um, in the field. And it looked like they were finally, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel was really going to be there. Mm -hmm. So, and then again, you know, I'm not a political history person, but I, uh, McClellan, McClellan was personally on one page, but his platform was far more peace oriented. Right, and so uh, there was a real contradiction between what McClellan said he was going to do, uh, because he seemed to be, you know, I will, I want to keep the union, and I'm the one who can deliver the peace. Uh, but his supporters and the platform were much more the Confederacy should be, if not left alone, at least brought in under, you know, pretty lenient terms. That's yeah. my interpretation. So I think McClellan, you know, McClellan suffered from sort of the self-inflicted wound of trying to piece together a party that was far uh, less pro-union than he 
mm-hmm. purported to be. So mm-hmm. how that works in Adams County, I don't know. I don't either. Uh, but it's interesting to think about. All right. So that brings us up to 1860. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we took the break? And uh, No, I think we've covered um, the questions. Covered a lot of good things. Yeah. yeah. Now, so, for those of you listening, this is a general overview of the town. Um, uh, just to maybe kind of whet your appetite for future shows about that are a little more specific related to the town and we'll have town guides on for it and hopefully Ted will come back. But in the meantime, uh, we're going to go away for a little break and then we will be back with your questions. Of course, patrons are the ones who get to send in the questions to be read on the show. Patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg is the way to help this keep on going because I am tired and we need more patrons and more people and all that other stuff. All right. So we'll be right back. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our sutlery at addressinggettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sell from your mug. So head over to addressinggettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's addressinggettysburg.com slash shop. Our favorite bookstore in Gettysburg is For the Historian, located at 42 York Street. It's because they have the best selection of Civil War books in Gettysburg, both new and used. And online, they have even more to choose from. And if the Civil War isn't your thing, that's not a problem. This is For the Historian, after all. They cover history from the ancient world to the 21st century with a strong selection of World War II and American Revolution books. It's astounding how many thousands of titles from Osprey, Savas Beatty, UNC Press, and more they have in their store. And that's because, well, they have a warehouse too. And that's where they keep all the books that are available online at ForTheHistorian.com. And folks, if you go to ForTheHistorian.com now and order books until you're blue in the face, be sure you mention that you heard about them on Address in Gettysburg in the note to seller box and they will refund your shipping costs and if you prefer to stop by when you're in town well you could do that too just mention address in gettysburg at checkout and they'll take 20 percent off the retail price of your item so go to forthehistorian.com or stop by 42 york street or you can call them at 717-685-5207 that's forthehistorian.com or 717-685-5207. What do Getty's Bike Tours customers say? Very family friendly. We had a wonderful time with our son. Me and my friends were able to uh, rent these bikes and go at our own pace. So we were able to just do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. And I highly recommend it to anybody else. It seemed like the right way to go to view the, the wonderful sites and also get an incredible amount of history from Bob. Our tour guide Bruce was so knowledgeable about the facts and the history of these battlefields that I came away with an understanding uh, that was unmatched by any other means. The breeze on the battlefield made up for the hot day. I had a wonderful time, a great trip, lots of history, um, wonderful bike ride, perfect weather, could have asked for a nicer day. Uh, Highly recommended. Uh, If you're going to tour Gettysburg, I would recommend doing it on the bike, it's a lot of fun. I loved it, it was awesome. Um, We really couldn't stump the professor with any of our questions, so uh, we we thought it was really well worth it. It was an excellent day out and got you outside and experienced the weather, beautiful weather out here today. We we had a lot of fun. If you're thinking about it, I just say, give it a shot. It was awesome for us. I hope it's awesome for you guys too. Go to gettysbike.com or call 717-752-7752 to book a battlefield experience you will never forget. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg podcast with Matt Callery. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are back again. Uh, Patreon.com slash Addressing Gettysburg if you ever want to send in questions for our guides when we do our Ask a Guys. And uh, we're going to start here with Kevin Randolph. Kevin Randolph has a question. He says, there are several buildings that exhibit battle damage. Was the damaged property left as an early effort to attract tourism or to preserve the memory or lack of funds to repair? So I'm going to venture um, uh, the answer being in the middle, which is I would I would think based on what I've read that um, these uh, markings of of shells or the actual shell is really the family's um, effort to 
uh, document in a, in a tangible way that a, that a, a Civil War shell went through their building. Mm. And uh, I, I do not think that the uh, issue of lack of funds is really uh, the issue, because if you look at the nine or so spots in town, uh, those uh, are situations where a shell and it might be a, a, a spherical cannonball or more likely to be a, a, a projectile that's uh, more shaped like a, a, a small rocket or a canister, uh, meaning, you know, mm-hmm. cylindrical with a, with a rocket type tip, uh, solid or, or hollow with a fuse, uh, pass through the wall, the exterior wall, and either explode or get embedded or, uh, in one example, uh, supposedly roll down the stairs and outside Jeez. without exploding. Scary. So uh, uh, the contemporary, uh, the problem we have is the uh, contemporary accounts uh, tend to be those who were there at the time. And it's not necessarily the same owner who had the house you know, decades later. Right. Uh, again, I'm going to give credit uh, to... Uh, 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 Adams County Historical Society uh, expert Tim Smith, who wrote a great article, I'll say 1996, on Gettysburg's uh, battle damage. And he reviews uh, nine examples in the town and describes them all. And uh, he doesn't say this the way the questioner asked the question, but I think. Uh, the answer is really that the families, uh, either firsthand or secondhand, uh, were witnesses to the to the shell uh, uh, going into their house, uh, and they wanted uh, their families and even people later to see this is what had happened mm-hmm. at that location. And so. lest anybody think when you see these shells that they just perfectly landed in the brick like that and stuck there like those were bricked in that way yeah i i would say that based on what i've read uh, probably most of them uh had a bigger uh impact and, and broke through uh, by the velocity mm-hmm. uh the uh, the one that's probably the most well known because it's so visible is the uh it looks like a spherical cannon shell uh, on um, the south side of York Street. The old cannonball the, restaurant. Used to be ice the cream. Uh, yes, and yeah. it's, it's Lulu's ice cream, yeah. and that used that was at the time of the battle uh, the Tyson Brothers photographic gallery. Mm-hmm. And uh, based on what I've read from Tim Smith's article, uh, people are fairly confident that that is the actual. Uh, shell and has not been disturbed. So that one landed the way it's, is that what you're saying? That, uh, presumably, that yes. It doesn't seem in. like that one has been moved uh, one bit, whereas some other shells uh, uh, probably have been moved, um, whether it's one foot or two feet or, you know. Uh, so I wonder, I'm oh, sorry, I, I, I wonder if, if the one on the Cannonball Ice Cream Place is hasn't been touched is it is, do we know is it a solid shot or is it a shell or well it's a spherical shell uh-huh. and uh i don't know uh probably tim smith's article would tell us i don't know if it's a solid shell or would have had powder with a fuse so it could explode well right so that's my question it's like that uh the cannon in the Rhode Island uh, State House that had the yes. full load in there. So I'm wondering if anybody ever looked to see if it's full of powder still. And well, you know, yeah, I don't know. Be interesting um, if it ever gets hit by lightning. Yeah. Well, I, I, I always say to people on my tour that if you if you want to go into that second story window and start hammering at the shell, it's uh, it's uh, you're. It's your risk. It's yeah. really not mine. Yeah, hammer at your own risk. Uh, Corey Russo says, are there any townspeople left whose ancestors lived in Gettysburg at the time of the battle or fought there? Uh, yeah. Yes. I know uh, a good number of them, and I'm sure you've met some. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, I'll call them founding families or yeah. families that were here during the battle, and you can still... 
uh, recognize their descendants. Uh, Troxel, uh, Mayor Troxel, yeah, late Mayor, the mayor Troxel. Yeah. Uh, their Trosels, Sheeds, Trosels, uh, yeah. Spanglers, Spanglers, uh, Swopes, Swopes. Oh yeah, yeah I've so, met. I think I've met or heard of yeah. someone from all of the names of famous battlefield locations, like farms. You know that yeah. you know Spangler, Culp. Uh, you know they're they're uh, they're everywhere. These were big families back then. Oh yes, that's and right. uh, yes, you know yes. a good chunk of them, I'm sure, yeah. move away. I know of I know actually I know there's yeah. many that move away. And yeah. but yeah, uh, there's definitely uh, yeah, that's definitely. A case. In fact, uh, if you're a patron, you you heard um, uh, Matt Sheeds come on to talk about his grandfather Colonel Sheeds, and they're related to Carrie Sheeds, so they go way yes, back. Yes, yes, good point. So yeah, there's people around. Uh, okay, Stephen Byers. What buildings in the town, if any, were part of the Underground Railroad? Okay, this is um, a very controversial topic generally, yeah. but uh, I uh, am going to go a little bit out on a limb and say I don't think there are any that we can really say unequivocally yes. Uh, because this isn't something you would advertise back in those days. Right. Hey, everybody, our house is safe for fugitive slaves. That's because right. Because you know there's people that are looking for fugitive slaves. Yeah. And the, and again, putting my legal hat on for the moment, uh, even in the Constitution, there was a fugitive slave clause, mm. uh, which the southern states uh, obviously wanted. Yeah. And uh, in the Compromise of 1850, uh, there was a fugitive slave provision, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think either side liked it because the the southern states wanted uh, a very uh, uh, strong enforcement mechanism if a, if a slave uh, escaped from, let's say, Maryland to Pennsylvania. In contrast, if I lived in Massachusetts, uh, I disliked uh, – what the abolitionists would call cooperation with slavery. Sure. And I wouldn't want to turn over uh, to a marshal or a constable uh, a runaway who is now in my house or right. my neighborhood. So, uh, so you really could not be overt about being a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Uh, people are pretty confident that the McAllister's Mill outside of town was a stop. Right. Uh, some people have argued that maybe the college harbored uh, underground oh, railroad yeah. uh, folks. Uh, but not the Dobbin House. Well, the Dobbin House is an interesting example because they do have a little slave hideaway uh, in, in, the, in the interior. Um, probably we should ask Jackie White of the Dobbin House that question uh, rather than myself. Uh, you could say on the one hand it's implausible because Reverend Dobbin had uh, slaves at one point in time. On the other hand, I think one of his sons uh, was anti-slavery. Mm. Uh, but uh, I'm in, if I had to argue the point, I would probably take the negative side because it seems that doesn't. Uh, I don't know. It's uh, yeah. There, there are yeah. historians. Uh, there are historians again whose views are controversial. Who have. Um, have outlined a whole number of farms outside the borough that would have been stopped. So when you think about it, uh, I would think that it's uh, it's probably easier to do that type of activity in a farm in a, in a remote area yeah. as opposed to in in a crowded city. Yeah, I was going to say block, that so. I would not be doing that in town. There's just too many witnesses that are just way too close. Yeah. But, you know, out in a farm, you can hide. You can hide in a haystack if you wanted That's to. Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Then you'd start sneezing. Or I would. Uh, okay. Rick Scarce. He is vying for six question Lentz's job of having a lot of questions here. So let's go through them now. Is it fair to say that Gettysburg was a farming community or market town? Well, a little bit of both, right? Yeah. I, uh, uh, when, I, uh, when I'm thinking about that question, um, the answer is yes. We just have to, I think, for lack of a lot of information, I don't know how much we can say how far the farmers are going to export their their raw materials. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I don't know. Because agriculture in this country and Pennsylvania doesn't become a big business with a B uh, until 
industrialization right. after the Civil War. Right. So it's not as powerful. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm guess is it is it fair to say that uh, up until that point, or at least up until the war, an agricultural society like Adams County um, is more more so, but not totally growing or raising whatever their product is for a local uh audience not audience market as opposed to exporting them you know because now you know you get potatoes raised in iowa yeah or idaho excuse me and you know and that's easy you know to do now because you know but back then yeah because yeah i think that makes sense you don't have um you don't have the infrastructure and you don't have vast canning complexes right you know things like that okay all right so is there any uh, reliable data on the value of the farm products coming from gettysburg or adams county in the years prior to the battle have you ever heard of uh, anybody uh i don't know complaining about how disgusting or praising how delicious the peaches were from here or something like that well again um if we're talking pre-civil war uh, I've seen some statistics that give like the total value, uh, but how comparative? I couldn't say. The, um, one of the best um, histories is uh, Robert Bloom's history of Adams County, and he has several chapters on agriculture and industry. And uh, I, I have it somewhere, but uh, you can find some very raw numbers in one of his chapters. I'm going to say if the if the reader can find like page 240 to 250, uh, I can pull it out. It's back in, in my uh, materials back here. But you can see some numbers. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, d- now, uh, he, he says, finally, apologies for an after battle question. But has anyone ever tried to, cro- uh, to quantify crop and livestock losses in the Gettysburg area specifically due to the battle? I've seen a general number or two, maybe in Coddington or Sears, but they covered the entire Confederate invasion area and were not localized. I don't know the answer to that. My, um, you would probably, it probably could be done because you could, uh, you could take all of the claims filed with, I'll say, the War Department or other government agencies, and every farmer uh, or civilian had to itemize what a loss of horse, what a loss of right. uh, bushels of hay. Uh, lost wheat uh, harvest, you could probably, if you counted all the claims uh, as submitted, you could probably get that number. Right. I haven't seen it compiled, but it could be done. Okay. Uh, Brian Svab, he wants to know, I've heard about all the different occupations and the number of them in town, but never about doctors. Were there a few doctors around town or some kind of small clinic? So um, touched on that earlier. Yeah. Clinic, um, no. Uh, doctors, yes. I've um, I've not done any study of the doctors, but um, prominent during the battle and the aftermath are two doctors uh, named Horner. Uh, they were brothers, I believe, and I believe they both had practices on um, Chambersburg Street. Hmm. And uh, there's an account, uh, I think, by, I'll say, Mary McAllister, uh, who wrote later about the uh, civilian experience that doctor one of the Dr. Horners came to her house uh, late in the evening. Um, I'm not sure if it's July 1st or 2nd, and basically uh, extracted a, uh, a bullet from a wounded U.S. Union soldier that night mm. by candlelight. Mm. And so the Dr. Horners were certainly prominent. Uh, there's another doctor some people have heard about, uh, Dr. O'Neill, who lived on uh, right. Baltimore Street. and He was uh, the one that met uh, the Confederates as they were coming in on the 30th, Yeah, the right? story about uh, Dr. O'Neill is that he was actually on a house call uh, out to a farm north, I'll say, of town, and he was intercepted by a Confederate patrol uh, as they were taking taking the perimeter and he was questioned and let go. Um, and he, of course, is more famous because he did like an inventory of the location of uh, um, 
where Confederates had been buried. Mm. And that's in his uh, one of his uh, register books that hmm. was used as a primary source. Interesting. Uh, okay. Roy Mead asks, or he says, my question for the guide is who came up with the idea for the diamond and when was it built? Okay. Well, um, as I say, the square, which was called the diamond, is really um, uh, a structural feature of, of the town as of the 1786 uh, plot plan. Mm. Uh, how early it's called the diamond, I don't know. Uh, I found actually just recently uh, a little advertisement from 1812 where that area is called the diamond with mm. a small d. So if someone wants to research it, uh, and I hadn't had a chance to do that yet, is one could try to find uh, the first reference to diamond in the Gettysburg newspapers uh, since it's not a it's not a um, it's not a formal a geographic name term. Right, it's, right. It's a colloquial term. Yeah. Uh, so that would be one way to to do it. Did uh, uh, and and as far as there, so it was there from the beginning. It was part of the original plan right. to have that diamond there at the intersection of the roads. Um, and I just. Uh, to me, like if you're going to call it a diamond, it means you have to be standing off axis. Like in other words, you got to be standing in like the. You got to well look at it from above. Well, it's still a square. Either way, it's a square. Even if you look at it off, it's still a square. I don't know. Sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. <laughs> Moving along, yeah. Mitch Randall says, "How does the introduction of the railroad to Gettysburg change the town from '59 up until the battle?" All right, so that's we we kind of covered that a little bit, but basically, what it opened it up. Yeah, it opened it up, and I think um, I, I, another interesting study would be how much uh, the railroad uh, was a freight railroad versus a passenger railroad during that time period. Uh, I have seen uh, passenger schedules printed in the newspaper. Uh, if you take a train from Gettysburg, uh, at a certain hour, you'll end up at your destination, and then you you reverse course because it's a it's a single track line. We have mm. to remember, so mm. it's not it can't take a lot of uh, traffic, uh, whether it's a, a box car or or a passenger car, because you, you you don't have a passing track. Right, right. So I don't know how much um, in that brief period it, um, it it changed economics, but it certainly. It's certainly a lot easier to get your goods to Baltimore, Philadelphia by rail than sure. by relying on a coach, meaning a, a, pa, a, a freight freight wagon. It so. seems like whatever impact it had, uh, by the time of the invasion, they had gotten pretty used to using it because it didn't take them very long to load stuff up on the trains and get them the hell out of town. Yes. Or like when there was that rumor, I can't remember when that rumor was, but it was, I think in 61, uh, there was the rumor that uh, the pug uglies were coming and uh, they had just sacked Hanover. And so finally somebody says, well, hey, why don't we take the train to Hanover and see what happened? And so like it, you know, they were using it, so yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously, it was it was a big thing for them to have. Uh, Bill Etzkorn, I'm not sure what the hell if he's joking here or something with this one here. Bill Etzkorn says, "Did the story of uh, in the 1758? Oh. Hold on, did the story in 1758 when 16 year old Mary Jemison was taken by Native Americans and refused to turn to white civilization in any way inspire Dances with Wolves?" Well, I know it's not a joke, but it's just. Like, well, I'm going to uh, call him out of left field Etzcorn from now on. <laughs> okay, I, I think the answer is probably no. Uh, I did a little bit of, I did a little bit of Google research to see, uh, and all I know is that the movie is based on a book. Yes. So. And there are a lot of stories oh. similar to Mary's oh, yes. uh, out there. Quanta Parker's mother was one like that who who refused to come back, and she had been well. She was raised from a little girl, you know. Yeah. Uh, so there's plenty of stories like that. Um, I don't know. It sounds kind of fun to me to just like live in a tent and just like live out on the land. I don't know. I would choose that over a city. If my choice was that or a city, I'm going for the TP. Okay, the cities are smelly. Um, all right, Josh uh, Buccioni. That's a good one. 
uh, of the approximately 11 artillery projectiles embedded in the outer walls of buildings in Gettysburg. Are any of them the original projectiles, or are they later additions to mark where a unit building had hit? So we know of that one on the cannonball, where yeah. we're pretty sure. Yes. But as far as the others go... Well, probably... Uh, there's good evidence that a majority of those were the original shell. That's mm -hmm. my guess based on the descriptions. Uh, some of them it's not so clear uh, based on what the family says. Uh, so I don't know. I guess I would, I, if I had to guess, I'm going to say probably five out of the nine, six out of the nine. You know, uh, yeah. Someone else would have to they're, verify that. They're at least. Uh, are, are we sure enough that we can say that they're at least battle projectiles oh yes yes okay yeah. so it's uh they might have just found them it's laying around somewhere but we don't know for sure that it's the actual one well i guess i will say that the evidence is 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 um really firm that a shell meaning um, a, a projectile from a cannon went through the building, went through mm -hmm. the brick, right. uh, and I think all these cases, maybe, maybe not all. Uh, whether literally the one that's that's situated there today is the same one, that's where there's some doubt. I think, right? But, but you can right. imagine. I, there's that one house on uh, Baltimore Street, um, a little bit up from Farnsworth, I believe. Yes, that's on the uh, east side. Yes. That whole facade is not battle era, so they they actually like put a new facade on the house, or maybe it's a whole new house. I don't remember. No, it's a facade. It's a facade. Yes. So uh, they put that on and then moved the shell and put it in there. Correct. Yeah, my understanding is that the shell, uh, which which is on the uh, front wall facing west, uh, right. second floor. Right above the uh, door. Yeah. So the shell would have come in in that direction, and that's Tilly Pierce says that. And I think um, I'm not sure if the Bergstresser, Strasser, Bergstresser uh, family said that too. That was the family that lived yes, there, Bergstresser. Yeah. yeah, it was the uh, very nice uh, Irish name. It was the um, Methodist uh, minister. Okay. Uh, that was the parsonage, I guess. So anyway. Uh, so there are there are either photos or postcards of the of the building, and then I'll say Victorian era. They put the facade on, and I think what happened is they pulled the shell from that then exterior brick right and and moved it and placed it in about the same place on the new yeah. into the new brick. Okay. That's so yeah, so you got to be careful when you're looking at all this stuff because yeah. it's not all what it looks like it is, yeah. but it mostly is. Okay, Brian Darnick is our last uh, question. Then I have one more question for you, and we'll close up. Uh, what were the town demographics during the pre-war years in regard to ethnicity, occupation, wealth, education, and political affiliation? So we kind of touched on all of these throughout, but right. in one concise answer, can you give us an idea? What are we talking ethnically? Uh, what? Well, I I don't know the the percentages, but I guess right. I would say we have a pretty diverse German, Scots, Irish mix, African American about eight mm -hmm. percent, um, and uh, there are like any community, you're going to have all stages of wealth. Uh, you have everything from very fancy brick houses to after all, we have an almshouse or poor house yeah, in the town. Right, right. So it's we have probably all economic strata uh, in 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 the town. It's not the ex it won't be the same extremes as in a modern urban setting mm -hmm. or in a pure agricultural setting. But a small town is going to have these um, uh, this diverse mix economically, politically, uh, religiously. You know, so it's uh, it's not a homogenous. It's a microcosm of America, right? At the probably, time. Yeah, probably, probably, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So I, I have now two questions for you. I just thought, of. Uh, but they're kind of related. Someone wants to become a town guide. Mm -hmm. How do they do it? And then part B to that question is, we name three books that you would highly recommend that people read about the town, regardless of whether or not they want to be a guide. Sure. Well, um, 
just by way of background, uh, our guide group started in about 2004. Mm -hmm. And so we've been doing tours for, you know, a number, large number of years. Uh, we have 12 guides right now, and our season is, is April through Remembrance Day. Uh, we actually have been trying to recruit some new guides. So if someone is interested, they should contact me somehow. Do you think Veronica should should go through with it and finish up and become a guide? She started the process yes. and then just flaked out. Yes. No, she she knows I've been mentioning her. Oh, you've been you've been bugging her? Yeah. In yeah. a nice way. She's been very supportive. Yes, uh, and I think yes, I think she should. She would be a great addition. Obviously. I agree. Uh, I agree. But anyway, uh, we we have a, a rigorous process. We have an interview, a uh, half-day exam, uh, and then the, um, the prospective guide has to go out with the experienced guides and, and know how to do a tour because doing a tour is not just knowing – you know, the 210 lots, you have to have personal skills. You have to be able to answer questions. Right. Uh, a lot of lot of talent uh, has to be uh, mustered to do something like that. Um, how much, so, percentage-wise, how much of, you, of being a, a good guide is talent and how much is knowledge? Is it an even 50-50? Uh, I don't know. I would... Mm -hmm. I would some people, some people in our group might argue 50-50. Some might argue 60-40 or 40-60. I would say. So that's just a range. I would say it's 80% talent, 20% knowledge. That's what I would say. All right. Well, that would be a... For anything. Yeah. Because you know why? Because 100% of, No. Because a good percentage of the people out there that are coming here to do this stuff don't know a thing about what they're coming here to see. Well, that's, I mean, I could go on, on at length on that topic, but we do have, um, we have a broad range of visitors. Of we'll course. Have, we'll have people who have been to Gettysburg year after year, but haven't been to the town. And then we have some people who will come and this is their first time in Adams County. So yeah. That's it. On the book side, I can give a few yes. recommendations. So three of those. Give okay. Me three. So um, I, I can put these. Visible, yeah. I'll, I'll hold them up. Just okay. you talk about them so, and I'll hold them up. This is uh, William Prasinito's uh, Gettysburg Bicentennial album. Uh, it's a great compilation of, of capsules of history with photographs and images. Um, it's, it's a great book. Obviously, all of his books are great, but that's a great one. Uh, another one I like is part of a series by a local historian, Jim Fritz. Jim hmm. is a friend of mine, so I'll make that disclosure. Okay. Uh, he uh, has a good blend of history, uh, ethnic uh, study, uh, architecture, uh, barn, uh, house preservation. This, what you're holding, is one out of four volumes of oh. Pennsylvania history. Uh, this one is focused on Gettysburg, but he's got several that are more York and... Uh, Lancaster. And look at that. There is the late Colonel Sheeds we were just yep. talking about earlier. And there he is in the book. Okay. And, and then one more. a third one is uh, uh, this is purely uh, 1863. This is a, sort of a compendium of civilian accounts. Uh, uh, it's nice because one, it proceeds chronologically mm -hmm. uh, from the battle. And it's also nice because uh, the author, Bennett, uh, Jared Bennett, has a great uh, map and a description of the location of the of the houses uh, from the civilian accounts. So you can you can use that book sort of as a as a geographic guide hmm. as well as experience uh, the civilians uh, right. accounts first hand. So to that's get, very good. I'll have to get the other two, but uh, Days of Uncertainty and Dread is uh, is a good little read. I like yeah, that one too. Yeah. I mean, there are many others, obviously. Oh, there's a ton of them. Yeah. There are a ton of them. Michael Lentz is waving his hand. What do you need, Mike? So how do you go about getting a tour from the city? Well, the hold, let me guy. finish the... Let me get to the end. <laughs> okay, Please. we can do it. <laughs> All right. So... How, do you, how does one get a tour okay. uh, if they're interested <laughs> All right. well, in a tour? Let me move this. So we have a website, um, and um, I'll, I'll put yeah. that one out there. I'll, I'll just read the website. Okay. Uh, www.gbltg.com. 
Uh, so you can go on the website and make a reservation. Uh, we also have a dedicated phone number, 717-253-5737. Uh, that's how you can do it. Uh, we have a basic town tour, which is the 90-minute. Uh, we also have uh, specialty tours, uh, presidential history. That one actually mm. is happening the month of February. Makes sense. Battle in the town. Uh, focused more on on the on the um, on the battle action, Black history. Uh, we have a tavern tour, uh, unsolved mysteries tour. A tavern tour. Wait, wait, wait. A tavern. <laughs> is this like a bar crawl type of thing, or you mean a tour of taverns that existed in history? The latter. Okay. Yes, the latter. We Damn it. Uh, we have had uh, just to be qualified. We have had um, in our tavern tour. Uh, uh, for the adults, uh, at the conclusion of the tavern tour, we've been able to offer them a voucher ah. for uh, a drink or a discount at a at a uh, winery or or a bar. Okay, so that's been a feature that's not it's not the same as 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 uh, a tour that is like a poor tour, right, or something right, like yeah. that. Just but the that unsolved word. mysteries tour sounds interesting too. Is that uh, what's that? What do you cover in that? Well. If I cover what then I... Then there's no point in taking the tour. Give me one. Give me one. Tell me one mystery. Don't tell us the whole okay. thing. Just well, tell us the mystery. Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, so, uh, many of you know Thaddeus Stevens uh, by name. He was a, a lawyer here in town for, I'll say, good... I'll say 20 years. Uh, he was implicated in a murder in, um, I'm going to say, 1823. Okay. Um, and... Um, that's the mystery. Okay, in that's short, good. I was going to stop you there if you went on. Cause and implicated, I'm not saying any more than Right, than you that. just implicate, yeah. Okay. Well, now, see, now that's interesting. I didn't know you guys had those uh, little theme tours. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And we're also... Battlefield guides don't do that. <laughs> we're also... Um, we're also uh, hoping to renew a tour that's focused on the battle and civilians in the southern end of town. Right. Uh, so that's another. Yeah, that'd be that cool, too. On, so. All right. Well, so that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you do take advantage of our uh, licensed town guides here because it is a it is a little known yet. I mean, you guys have been around since when? Oh, 2004. Yeah. I mean, long time. Yep. So uh, get out there. Take a town tour with a town guide. I'm telling you, this this is a very interesting town. There's a lot more than just the battlefield. Um, Ted, thank you very much for thank coming on. Thank you for on. having me on. Uh, I hope you had a good time. Thank you. And thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you next time. All right. All right. There we go. Are you a reenactor or living historian? Or maybe you're a War of Rights player and want to bring esprit de corps to your team. Well, then you need the Badge Maker, the leading provider of Civil War and other historical badges and insignias. Mention this ad with an attached message in your order and receive a free surprise gift. I myself bought a metal second core badge and it always starts a conversation when I wear it. So hit up the badge maker at civilwarcorebadges.com. Something for everyone and anyone. Our hearts so stout have got a stain for soon to snow from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down there and pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for that shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down.